Hey, welcome guys. I'm Pastor Rex, Senior Pastor at Pursuit Church. I want to thank you for joining us for this week's teachings from our Sunday worship service. If you would like more information, you can find us online at PursuitNazarene.org. My prayer is that God will grow your faith through the hearing of his word. So let's listen in. Here we go. All right. Well, this is our last week in a series called I Am Jesus. And last week we talked about the fact that Jesus was the resurrection and the life. In fact, he still is the resurrection and the life. But there are seven I am statements that he made in the Gospel of John that we've been exploring. We've been exploring ones like uh, I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. He also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am, and today we're talking about the fact that Jesus said in the Gospel of John, I am true vine. So let's look at this scripture. It's John 15, the first verse. Jesus says this. This is actually the last I am statement found in the gospel of John. Jesus says, I am the, say it with me, true vine. Okay, help me again. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. So I want us to dig into this and find out a little bit more about what does Jesus mean when he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Now, just a heads up, this is the, la the last one in the Gospel of John. It happens in the life of ministry of Jesus right before he's arrested, he's, tr he's tried, and then beaten, put on the cross, in the grave, and three days later, he ra raises again. So this is in the time where he's with his disciples, and he makes a statement with his followers around him saying, I am the true vine, my father is the gardener. Now, before we dive into John 15, we're going to look at it. It'll be on the screen, but you can also open up your Bibles or uh, your devices or whatever to that. I want just to picture a vineyard in your mind, because Jesus is talking about a vine and branches. And so I want us to get this idea, this metaphor that Jesus is speaking of, of a vineyard. Now, a vineyard is basically a plantation of grapevines. So normally, if you drive by a vineyard, it's a really cool thing to see, right? Because in our day, the rows are nice and straight, and there's one after another. It's just a really cool, aesthetically to the eye, it's like, ooh, that's beautiful. Look at that vineyard, you know? I love the ones that go up hills, and, are, and those are just really cool instead of just straight down a row on the flat ground. Those are just beautiful. And man, around Oregon, we've got a lot of vineyards around here. So we can, if, if you, you've probably driven by one, you probably have one in your mind of what that looks like. But a vineyard is a plantation of grapevines and grapevines grow clusters of what? Grapes. Okay, good. We're on the same page. <laughs> clusters of grapes. Okay, this, wasn't, this is not a trick question. This is not trick Sunday. Okay, this is it's pretty straightforward. And grapes are used for wine, raisins, grape juice, or even table grapes. Okay, so a variety of things come from vineyards that grow grapes. So, oh, jelly. That's true. Yeah. Jelly. Yeah, you can't go without. How many guys like grape jelly? Grape jelly. Okay. Strawberry jelly. Apricot jelly. With some peanut butter, crunchy peanut butter on some toast with grape. Oh, come on now. That's whew. okay. But we're talking about grapes. So let's get back, really back. So here we're going to go. We're going to dive into John chapter 15. Now we're going to do a couple things, okay? We're going to, I'm going to read this text two times. First time, it's going to be on the screen. You're going to read along. The second time, I'm going to ask you to just think about what you're hearing. Now that, for some of you, maybe you just want to close your eyes and listen to me. Some of you maybe want to read along. Some of you just want to maybe look down. But I'm going to read it twice. Here's what I'm asking of you. Although I have a sermon prepared, although I have an emphasis in this area where Jesus says, I am the vine, I want you, I want God to speak directly to you. And so we're going to go through this twice. I'm going to ask of you, listen to the text, listen to it. And I want you to pull out from that something that, that you see is valuable, something that speaks to you. Now, if you have notes, if you grab the bulletin, there's like a notes page, you can write down maybe what verse number it was or a word or a phrase, maybe write that down or think about that phrase. I really want you to hear it for you. Okay. Whatever it is that you need to hear, God will show that to you. So we're going to read it, and then you're going to listen to it. And I want, you to, I want you to take from this scripture something that you can go, that was for me. And then we're going to continue on, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach through the rest of this passage. So here we go. John 15, 1 through 11. Jesus is saying, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. 
You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remained in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now I wanna read this again and I want you to hear it. And I want you to pull from this whatever the Lord is speaking to you about and then I'm gonna continue on in the teaching today. And if you need to close your eyes just to listen, you can do that. If you wanna read along, we're not gonna have them repeat on the screen. But just listen. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will produce even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone does not remain in me. He's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The word of the Lord for us today. Amen. So as we dig into this scripture, I want us to understand the context of that. And I hope you took some time, maybe something the Lord gave to you, and I want you to write that down. Maybe you're going to revisit this. You're going to read this later and, and, and uh, maybe put it to memory. Maybe there was a portion of this that you want to put to memory. But I want us to understand about this. Jesus starts out saying, I am the true vine. Notice he doesn't just say, at first off, I am the vine. He says, I am the true vine. Now, why does Jesus say he's the true vine? Well, they would have understood that Jesus was giving a contrast to actually the people of God, to the Israelites. You see, in the Old Testament, the Israelites, the people of God, were also referred to as the vine in God's vineyard. I want to show you Isaiah 5-7. It says this, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. You see there that Jesus is contrasting himself with the people of God. He's not just the vine, the Israelites, but he is the true vine. So he's, he's dipping into what they know of what vine and, and God and that's that reference there, but he's saying, I am the true vine. Then Jesus says, my father is the gardener. So what is he referring to there? Well, God, he is, Jesus is referring to God as depicted as the garden tending his vineyard, the people of Israel. In fact, if you look a few verses before that, if you look at Isaiah 5, verses 1 and 2, it says, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on fertile hillside. He dug it up and he cleared it of stone and planted it with, with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes. And then we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but it yielded only bad fruit. But look at the majority of that text. Can you see that, that God, the gardener, he's taking care of his people. He's clearing the soil. He's taking the rocks out. He's building a watchtower. He is the keeper of his vineyard. And if you look in the Old Testament, that is so true, isn't it? God is the keeper of his people. And he is taking care of them. He is feeding them. 
40 years with manna when there was nothing else. I mean, he was dependable. He was their strength. He was their strong tower. Even when they turned their back and they said, God, help, what would God do? God rushed back and he rescued his people. Why? Because he was the gardener of his vineyard. He took care of his vineyard. So Jesus, again, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. But here's the deal is that, unfortunately, Israel failed to produce the fruit and it resulted in divine judgment. He failed to produce the fruit and it resulted in divine judgment. If we keep reading verses three and four of that Isaiah passage, it says this, now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? I've done everything for you. When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? We see that Israel wasn't able to hold their end of the bargain. They weren't able to keep God as always number one. They would lean on their own and they wanted their own kings. They wanted their own thing. And God was there. He was constant, but they didn't always fulfill what it is that God, the relationship that God wanted with his people. And so we know because of that, Jesus came into this world and Jesus did what no law could replace, what no man could ever do. He took the penalty for our sins and made a new covenant that it's not being an Israelite that allows you to have a relationship with God, but it is through Jesus Christ. So when he says, I am the true vine, he's replacing the old covenant with the new covenant. That it's through me that there's salvation. I am the true vine. It's not the laws that the Israelites had and the Jewish people have. It's not, that's not how you gain access to God. I am the true vine. I am the one that you want to be looking to. It's not a list of things that you can or cannot do to reach towards God. It is through me. He is the true vine. Now, I love verse two. I lo actually, I love all of this. This whole thing is one of my favorite parts of, of scripture is this vine and branches. But verse two, listen to this. Jesus tells us that God does two things to ensure maximum fruit production. Okay, that's kind of what I, maximum fruit production, right? He does two things to make sure that, that this vine, the, that the branches that are connected to the vine have the most fruit production. What does he do? The first thing he'll do is he'll remove unfruitful branches. He cuts off unfruitful branches. Now in the context here, this unfruitful branch are those who are, have not remained connected, who are not connected to the vine. They're dying away. They're just, they're just hanging on by, by just a kind of a little, a little, you know, you know what I'm talking about? I have this little plant kind of next to my driveway and I noticed um, over about, a week, couple weeks that this one branch, the, the leaf started to kind of brown a little bit. The rest of it was all green. And it kept getting browner and then it get gray. And then it was like, what's wrong with this thing? So I went over to it and looked closely and I went to grab it and it just, it just came right off. It wasn't even connected. It was like barely, it was like a thread. Something, something must have happened. It got kicked, the ball got hit to it. I don't know. Um, or, or someone went and broke it and it was just kind of hanging down there. But it was not connected. And so it needed to be cut off. It needed to be removed. Why? Because it wasn't going to do a thing. In fact, it was browning. It wasn't even getting any green at all. So we see that Jesus tells us that God, the gardener, he cuts off unfruitful branches. These are those who are loosely connected, but they don't truly believe. They don't truly believe. There's no genuine faith in God. There might have been an initial belief and in following, but it was based probably on selfish motives. If you look at the story of the Gospels, you'll see this happening. You'll get people that are like, wait, we get dinner tonight? Sweet fish and bread? That's awesome. In fact, I'm so full. Do you remember the story of feeding the 5,000? What did they do immediately the next day? They went looking for Jesus, right? Oh man, I'm ready for another good meal. They were believers in Jesus because they were getting something out of it for them. But once the teaching got a little bit hard, once their faith was tested, they're like, I'm out. <laughs> that was enough. I don't really want to go down that road. They weren't connected in a way that their faith really made sense. It was a selfish, maybe, oh yeah, I, I like what I see. Yeah, that's great. Oh, I get something out of it? Sweet, I'm going to keep looking for something out of it. But it wasn't a genuine faith. It was really selfish motives. And so we see that when Jesus is talking about that, the disciples are going, oh, I know what you're talking about. I remember that crowd. And they bailed after you were like, hey, my disciples, you know what? That's those who pick up their cross. They're like, a little too much for me. Thank you. I'm going to go find something else. They remembered what he was talking about. But the second thing that God, the gardener, does to ensure maximum fruit production is he prunes all the other branches. 
And all the other branches are branches that are connected to the vine, okay? He prunes them so that they will have fruitful branches. So he trims them down so that they can produce maximum fruit, okay? Good fruit, lasting fruit, juicy fruit. Not juicy fruit, the gum. You know what I'm talking about, okay. So that's what's going on in verses one and two of I am the true vine. And he cuts off and he prunes. There seems to be a theme here as, you, as we read through this that producing fruit is very important. Did you catch that? It was all about producing fruit. In fact, not just producing some fruit, but producing more fruit, really good fruit, fruitful fruit. There, that was, that's, there's a theme in this, these 11 verses. It's all about bearing fruit is probably the word that you heard more, but that's producing fruit. It seems to be very important in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. If you say yes to Jesus and follow him, then guess what? you'll be producing fruit. I don't mean that you're going to be looking for a job at a grocery store as the, at, in, the, in the fruit section. That's not what I mean. Or you have to start planting apple trees if you're a Christian. That's not what I mean. We're talking about a different kind of bearing fruit. But it seems to be, because it's mentioned four times, I'm sorry, five times in these 11 verses, producing fruit, produce fruit, produce fruit. You got to produce fruit. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, what are you going to be doing? Producing fruit. What does that mean? Well, it's not just important. It's actually part of our design as followers of Jesus Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you are to produce fruit. That's actually part of your purpose is to produce fruit. You're not just supposed to, maybe you think yourself as a fruit, like, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to be a fruit. I'm supposed to be nice and shiny and good and take, you know. No, you're supposed to produce fruit. You're the branch that produces fruit. If you're a follower, have, we, have I said that yet? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're gonna produce fruit. It almost seems like you could say, so, hey, Mr. Branch, um, Mrs. Branch, you're not really producing any fruit. What are you doing? <laughs> Mr. Branch, what are you here for? I mean, if you are a branch that's connected to the vine, then you're going to be producing some grapes. I don't see any fruit. So, well, Mr. Branch, what are you doing? I mean, you're just kind of wasting your time. You're just kind of filling space on the vine. Why are you even here? Because those who follow Jesus, who are connected to the vine, they're producing fruit. And if we are followers of Jesus Christ, then we are producing fruit. Whatever fruit just popped out when I did those noises, that's the fruit that you can go with, okay? What is bearing fruit? Here's bearing fruit. It's good results coming from a life of a believer. Good results coming from a life of a believer. Now, I'm not talking about saved by good works. This is, a, this is a outpouring of a follower of Jesus Christ. It's good results coming from a life of believers. So it won't be anything evil. It won't be anything corrupt. The fruit of a follower of Jesus Christ, the bearing of that fruit is not something that draws us away from God, but rather towards God. Let me give you some examples is of, of bearing fruit or producing fruit, bringing benefit to the lives of other people. That's producing fruit. Encouraging somebody. There are people out there that are awesome encouragers. They just can encourage, encourage, encourage. You leave just going, you feel good about yourself. Encouragers, you can build up the life of somebody else. Some people know how to just bless. Man, they bless and they bless and they bless. Guess what? That's fruit. You're bearing fruit. When you bless somebody else because God has been blessing you, you are producing fruit. You might be, be able to just give. Man, God has been able to give you the gift of giving and you give and you're giving to other people. You're giving to, to his church. You're giving to organizations. You're just, that's your life. You give of your resources. You give of your money. You give of your time. You are producing fruit by good results coming from a life of a believer. Some of you are leaders and you can lead other people. You can say, you know what? This is a cause. Come with me. Let's rally together. And people going, oh yeah, I want to do that. And you're like, okay, let's do that together. Yeah, let's do that together. Let's go. Whoa, charge. You know, you're just a leader and God is using you in that way as you're producing fruit. Some of you are great guides. You say, hey, come along. Let's do this together. You see that? Yeah, God did that. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that, hey, God can do that. You really can do that. You guide people along. You can mentor people along. You're producing that. Caring. So you bring benefit to the lives of others. Another way that producing fruit, what it looks like, is advancing the work of God around the world and in our own neighborhood. Sharing Jesus is producing fruit. It might be with a coworker, or you might be called to be a missionary in another country. By advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're bearing fruit. You might be called to, to teach or to preach or share or invite 
inviting people to church even is a part of what it looks like when you're producing fruit in your life. You know that good fruit should multiply itself. It should multiply itself. If you look at the uh, parable of the, the, the sower of seed in Matthew 13, it said that the crop was like tens and hundreds and it just kept multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. You influence one person and that person can influence maybe two. Now you've influenced three people, right? And those two people are gonna influence maybe one others. Now that's, and so you, you can do the math in your own head, but multi, good works through our producing of fruit and influencing people for Christ, it multiplies itself. And it should always be doing that. The other thing of a good fruit looks like is godly character. Galatians 5, 20 through through 24 says this, but the fruit of the spirit, ah, see the word fruit, okay? See the theme we're going with here? But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Self-control, when you have self-control, you're bearing fruit because it's fruit of the Spirit. That's so cool. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if you follow Jesus Christ, you've said no to the earthly flesh, and instead you are, you are producing godly fruit, fruit of God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control. Those are godly fruits. So you see now why when Jesus is saying, hey, it's about fruit production. Now it's not like Jesus or God is, is saying as a gardener, I just want you to produce, 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 and that's, you know, I'm just gonna have you met your quota. He's not doing that. He's not a clipboard God making sure that you're doing the right thing. And in fact, if we read that word remain, I mean, it's not about getting a job done but it's about producing what naturally should be just flowing out of you as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus talks about pruning. Now pruning is not a fun thing to talk about when you bring it to your own life, right? It says that he prunes those that are connected so that they will have maximum fruit production, right? What is that about? Pruning is this. It's a picture of painful but necessary removal of some interest and activities in order that the remaining branch might bear even more fruit. I'm gonna say that again. It's a picture of painful but necessary removal of things in our lives in order that we bear even more fruit. I went to YouTube to find out why and how to prune um, grape branches, a, a vineyard. If I work, for, I could work for a vineyard right now because I know how to prune. I have looked it up. I watched several of them because I wanted to get the context of that. And this is what I find, this is what I find out, at least nowadays, they will prune 90% of last year's growth to make room for this year's growth. 90%. So all those branches that you see sticking up, they'll prune 90% of those. In fact, they want to look for the closest one to the head of the vine. So you have the, like it comes up the trunk and then it goes out this way. Oh man, I forgot what that word of that was. But anyway, right there, they want to do as close to that as, as possible. And they'll like prune all these other, they'll be like, I don't know, 20, 30, even more than that. And they'll just do two or three. And then sometimes down to one, one branch. And then it'll, this branch will be like this long and it'll have all these little buds on it. And they'll actually cut, they'll leave two and then cut right above that. Those two buds, why do they do that? To make room for new fruit. Because if you don't prune it, it's gonna be all like, grapes are gonna be all up in each other's business. It's gonna be like way too much going on, okay? But if you want good fruit and you want it to taste good, you want it to look good and full, then you've gotta give it room to grow. You gotta give it the space that it needs and you want it to get the nutrients from that vine and, and, and have all of it going to that fruit. In our lives, pruning can be a very painful process, but I'm telling you, it's God's way of making room or the things that are yet to come in your life. Pruning in our lives is really close to this word prune in the Greek, kathairo, it often means to clean. God desires to clean our lives. It's only done that through the blood of Jesus Christ, but he comes and he cleanses us. 
the pruning, the cleaning in our lives, it may be painful. In fact, it may bring things out to the open that we're embarrassed about, that we're shameful about, that are painful in our lives. But he's pruning those and cleaning those areas so that we can make room for the things that God is about to do through us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, two things are gonna happen. You will be pruned and you will produce fruit. You will be pruned and you will produce fruit. So just get ready for it. Just get ready for those painful times. And I don't know for you what it looks like. It might be a loss of something, a job, a person, maybe in a relationship, a dating. She said, I don't wanna go out with you anymore. Or, or he said that. Or it might be, a, 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 I don't know what it is for you. But more than likely, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've already experienced some pruning. You've already experienced some hardships. You're like, oh, that does not feel good at all. I'll tell you why he's doing it. So you save yourself to God. Why? Because he's making room for a greater blessing. He's making room for his purpose to shine through you so that you can produce more fruit for him. Because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're gonna be pruned, but you're also gonna produce fruit, a fruit that will glorify God, that will everything in your life will point to Jesus. And people will go, dude, you've got it going on. Oh, well, it's because I've been pruned. Let me tell you about that pruning story. And you can tell someone about it. You can say, but here's what God has shown me. Here's what God has taught me. Here's how God showed himself. I thought I was all alone in this, but God showed his presence to me. It was amazing. And you know, we can share all those pruning stories as we want, but it will never take the place of somebody else's. You'll be pruned. Just be ready for it. Just be ready. You can keep your arms inside and your feet together and go, oh, you can't cut anything off. He, we're gonna be pruned. We're gonna be cleansed. It may hurt initially, but it has beautiful long-term results. Jesus says, I'm the vine, the true vine. Through Jesus, there's salvation. Not through the nation of Israel, but through Jesus. He's a true vine. What the nation of Israel could not accomplish, Jesus does. Jesus is not only truth, he is the way, he is the life. And in order for us to have life, we must be connected to that truth, to that life, to the vine. In order to fully live, we must follow the one who is now alive. So we celebrated a resurrection Sunday last week. By fully living, it's because we trust in the one who is fully alive. And that's how we produce the fruit. Followers of Jesus were the branches. Notice on the branches, you don't, the branches aren't what looks nice. It's the fruit, right? When you look at an apple tree, what are you looking for? An apple, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for helping me out there. <laughs> if you get close to a vineyard and you're looking at a grapevine, what are you looking for? An apple. No, no. <laughs> Tough crowd, tough crowd. That's okay. You know what? You can look for an apple all you want. And if you find one, dude, you're going to make a lot of money because uh, we can, you know, we're always looking for ways to new fruits. Anyway, I saw a fruit the other day in the grocery store. It was a, a tangelope or something like that. Did you, have you seen those? Oh, I don't, tangelope. It was like a, what is that? A tangerine and a cantaloupe? Tangelope? Anyway, yeah. Uh, grapples? Grape apples. It's not just in a bottle, like the juice? It's <laughs> wow. See, this is really cool. You learn a lot of things in church, don't you? All right. Jesus followers do two things. Okay, two things are going to happen, and you got to do two things, Okay. Two things that are going to happen. One is you're going to be pruned, but you're going to produce fruit. Fruit. Two things that you must do is this. Stay connected, and you will bear fruit. Stay connected, and you will bear fruit. Genuine salvation is evidenced by a life of fruitfulness. A follower of Jesus Christ, the way you know they're a follower of Jesus Christ is because they are producing fruit that gives God glory. That is how we see that someone is following Jesus Christ. Right? By the fruit that it bears. How do you know it's an apple tree? Hmm, maybe the apple hanging down from it? Or the 
gray apple, whatever that thing was called that you were mentioned, uh, you will not succeed as a Christian unless you are linked with, glued to, grafted in, clinging to the true vine, Jesus. I'm going to say that again. You will not succeed as a Christian unless you are linked with, glued to, grafted in, clinging to the true vine, Jesus. You won't. Our job as a branch is to hold on tight to the true vine. You must remain. Notice that word remain comes up 11 times in the 11 verses. We must remain. We must stay connected to Christ. That is so, so powerful. Staying connected is vital for our success as Christians. It gives us purpose. It gives us vision. It gives us passion. It gives us meaning. And some of you are going, man, I don't know what life holds. I can tell you how to find the answer to that. Get connected to Jesus like you've never been connected before. Look at Psalms, Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with the mockers. Mock, 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 mock. They delight in the, but they, okay, these are different, that delight in the law of the Lord, meditate on it day and night. Before, hold on, go back to that slide, Leonard. Go back to the previous one. Okay, so we're talking about staying connected, right? Okay, you want to succeed in a life of Jesus Christ, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating it day and night. That is how you stay connected right there. It's all about God's word. Now go to the next one. So what happens to those that stay connected? They are like trees planted along the riverbanks, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Do we want success as a Christian people? Because that's the way that God has designed for us. And I don't mean success in man's eyes. I mean in God's eyes. If we want to succeed, you've got to stay. It keeps you grounded when life tries to tip you over. Staying connected gives you victory over temptation and freedom from bondage. Some of you might be coming to a temptation and it just knocks you down every single time. Get connected to Jesus and he gives you victory over temptation. Helps you learn to trust that God really meets our needs. He really does. The bottom line is to produce fruit. We've covered that, right? The bottom line is to produce fruit. Fruit that will last. Fruit that glorifies God fruit that gives God glory, it points right back to him because the point of our lives is to point to him. I want you to imagine for, for a minute what kind of fruit you could produce for the Lord. Okay, imagine what kind of ministry, you don't have to be a pastor or missionary to answer this question. What kind of ministry, what kind of impact, what kind of influence could you make for the kingdom of God? If you had a dream about what that would look like, right? If there was all the time in the world, all the money in the world, all the resources in the middle, in the world. What would you do for the Lord? What would it look like? What kind of fruit would you produce? What is your dream of ministry in the kingdom of God? Can I tell you that I believe that God has planted that seed in your mind and heart. And although you may not see that complete fruit come, I believe that that seed planted is God, God's work in you. Imagine what kind of fruit you could produce. There's no way that the Apostle Paul in the New Testament understood the fruit that he was producing as he diligently preached God's word, as he obeyed the Holy Spirit and where he was supposed to go, as he suffered in chains, as he wrote these letters and he, he preached and taught and he did his work understanding those who didn't know the Lord so he could, who, he didn't know the, what the fruit would look like. Imagine Billy Graham in his early years. He, I bet he never knew the fruit that he would produce through his life. But the only way he was able to do that was because he remained connected. The fruit he produced could only be as powerful as how connected he was to the vine. My grandparents. Grandparents are the best praying people in the world, okay? They are. And I've, I've heard stories. I've heard it from myself. My, my grandma Nelson, when she was alive, told me about praying for her son for years and years and years and years that he would come to know the Lord. He had drifted from the Lord, prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and he finally accepted the Lord as Savior of his life. I know the prayers of my grandma Baker. She'll never see the full fruit of her prayers, but I'm telling you, the fruit of her prayers is powerful. It's awesome. And when she's gone, the fruit of her ministry and her life and her influence will continue on. Imagine the possibilities 
of the fruit that you will produce. But the only way that your fruit will have value and gain is if you stay connected. If you remain, 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 remain. Tell the person next to you, remain. Go ahead, tell them, remain. That means stay connected. Stay connected. So here's the deal. This is a one sermon, this is a one point sermon. Your first priority is to always stay connected to Jesus. Your first priority, your first priority is always stay connected to Jesus and then we will produce fruit. Staying connected to the vine because he does the work. Imagine you had an apple tree, since we've talked about apples, apple tree in your backyard. As a gardener, you tend to it. You make sure you feed it. You, if you wanna put some kind of fertilizer and stuff around it, you water it, you might prune it, you might pull the weeds, you might make sure it has the best possibility to get as much sunlight when it needs it. You'll do everything you can to care for that tree, but there's one thing you cannot do for that tree. You cannot produce fruit for it. You cannot squeeze out an apple and then put it up on the tree and say, oh, look, good, I took care of my tree. You can't do that. That's the one thing that the tree can do that you cannot do, and that's bear its own fruit. You can't bear it for it. But because of the care that the tree is given, it will produce fruit. Our God, the gardener, cares for one thing, the strength and the health of its branches. You and me. He's the one who's caring for us. He's the one whose strength is when we don't have any. He's our shade when it's too hot. He's our living water when we're thirsty. He's a full stomach when we're starving. And if we are not remained connected to him, we will not see the results that he's designed for us to see. But God is our gardener. He tends to his vineyard. Are you trusting in him? Are you staying connected to him as priority? If you wanna bear fruit, see that your inner life is right. That your relationship with Jesus Christ is clear and close. That's a great way to put it, isn't it? Make sure that your relationship with Jesus is clear and close. Lord, clean me, prune me so that I may be close to you to bear the fruit that you want for me. I wanna give you some encouragement on staying connected. What does this look like? Private worship, prayer, Bible study? Are you doing that? What does this look like in your life? I want you to think about your last week, last two weeks. What does that look like in your life? Or how are you staying connected? If the answer is, I've stayed connected, but it's been kind of uh, hit and miss, I wanna challenge you to take it the next step. How can I do this every day? If some of you are not connected at all, you're not, you've, you've said yes to Jesus, I want him in my life, but you are not connected to the true vine, you will die out. You need to be connected, that's your first priority. I want you to think about this last couple of weeks, what does that look like? If you are not connected, what will you do and when will you do it? Think about it. When will I read my Bible? When will I spend time in prayer? Will I start a prayer journal or things that I'm thinking and praying about? If you're not doing that, then I wanna encourage you, start doing it. When, what time of day? Do you have a place in mind? Set those things down and that will help you stay connected. Because when we have the time and the place and it becomes a habit for us, a spiritual discipline, man, it's gonna be awesome. You're gonna be able to thrive. So what does this look like? And then what step do you need to take to get connected even deeper? That's what the Lord wants. He wants you to remain in Him, to stay connected. So what will you do? tonight, tomorrow morning, what will it be? Would you bow your heads as we close in a word of prayer? Thank you, Father, for being the gardener. And you care for your, for us. You strengthen us. You shelter us. You're the tower we run to. Thank you, Lord, that you are always, always there and you don't stop caring and working for us so that we can give you glory. So Lord, may we stay connected to the true vine. Thank you that salvation is only through Jesus Christ. But Lord, may we remain in you because we know that apart from you, we can do nothing. And Lord, I don't wanna just waste my life and do nothing, but I wanna do things that you have set out. And so Lord, I know that that means I've gotta stay connected, stay connected, stay connected. So Lord, for me, would you help me 
to get up when I need to get up earlier so that I can be in your word, so that I can pray for my family. Pray that you will bless the day. Pray that you will allow me to be a blessing to others. Lord, as I dig into your word this week, will you show me what it looks like to be a man of God? Would you show me your character and how trustworthy you are and your faithfulness through your word this week? But I pray the same thing for everyone here. I thank you that you are the true vine and that you care for us and that you want us to produce fruit, fruit that will last. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we finish with a prayer blessing? May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I hope that you have been encouraged and challenged to pursue a deeper faith in God through what you've heard. If there's any way that we can help you in your new faith in Jesus Christ, please contact us at PursuitNazarene.org and we would love to talk with you. May God bless you this week and hope to see you back again soon. Thanks.